Welcome to today's webinar. I'm now handing over to Chair Philip Chu. Thank you very much. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. So today we are very delighted uh, to organize uh, the laparoscopic endoscopic collaborative surgery webinar by the World Endoscopy Organization. I'm Professor Philip Chiu from the Department of Surgery, Faculty of Medicine, Chinese University of Hong Kong. And uh, tonight, we, today or tonight, we have a renowned speaker from around the globe, including uh, Professor Lee Srenstrom from U, um, Europe and USA, um, Professor Hong Chi Yi from uh, Hong Kong, China, uh, uh, Professor Ito from Japan, and Professor Rao from India, which will be focusing uh, in this uh, area of um, laparoscopic and endoscopic uh, management of a gastric GI stromal tumor. So without further ado, I'd like to uh, start the session uh, by introducing um, Professor Lee uh, Srenstrom. So um, of course, I think uh, everyone knows uh, Professor Lee Srenstrom and uh, he is a, a renowned uh, surgical innovator and also um, uh, laparoscopic surgeons. I think he is now having a both uh, affiliation to ERCAT, uh, France, and also uh, in United States as a leading surgeon and innovator. So, uh, Lee, please start uh, your talk. Okay, thank you very much, Philip. Um, it's great, great honor to be able to present to everybody and uh, see all my friends as well, uh, even though we're not able to meet in person, but uh, maybe the next time. Let me share my screen. Okay, so um, you asked me to give a talk about endolaparoscopic or hybrid treatments of just tumors. I really like the format of this meeting, by the way, because it focuses on such a specific topic. So I think we'll have a great time uh, discussing that. So my uh, de declarations uh, are as follows. So just a, a brief, since I'm the first speaker, a very brief uh, background for just tumors. I think most people are aware that they're the most common mesenchymal tumor of the GI tract uh, and, and usually are found in the, in the stomach. So this is the most relevant to uh, talk about that. Uh, one of the difficulties in dealing with them has always been that they're difficult to, uh, to predict as far as their biologic behavior, uh, which ones are malignant or have a risk of malignancies and which ones are totally uh, benign. Uh, they come from the interstitial cells of Cahill. Uh, everybody knows their C-kit. Um, uh, they can express this kit and of course that directs the preoperative uh, neoadjuvant treatment uh, on times, but I'm not going to talk about that. I think for those of us who intervene and please, the most important thing to consider are the prognostic factors, both from a technical standpoint and from a biologic standpoint. That's the diameter. Obviously, the bigger they are, the higher the risk of malignancy, uh, their grade uh, or differentiation, and their mitotic count. And I think most of us uh, know about this. So uh, back in the day, of course, one would do an open gastrectomy uh, for uh, any just tumor of note. Uh, this changed quite a bit with the arrival of laparoscopic surgery and minimally invasive surgery. Uh, it was described at the very beginning of lap coli uh, because this is an obvious target. In the early days, of course, they replicated the open approach, which is a major gastrectomy or partial gastrectomy. Uh, and it was not until uh, really the availability of endoscopic, flexible endoscopic approaches that the treatment began to cone down into a less invasive treatment and organ sparing uh, treatment. So uh, cur currently wedge resection, two to three centimeter margin uh, is acceptable, sometimes distorts the stomach, uh, but more and more we do endoluminal or extra and endoluminal uh, hybrid treatments to preserve as much of the stomach as possible. So uh, 
there's lots of options for treatment and they kind of span the spectrum from uh, very invasive to very minimally invasive. Um, obviously, depending on uh, the risk to the patient, as far as malignancy, uh, one or the other can be selected. Uh, but I, I'm going to concentrate my portion of the talk on these hybrid procedures in the middle of the spectrum. So, so choosing uh, which approach you're going to do depends, as I've mentioned, on the size, uh, the location, and, and the risk of malignancy. Uh, the higher the risk of malignancy, the larger the size, and the more difficult the location, uh, the more one is pushed toward a surgical section, either laparoscopic or even still on occasion open. Uh, it's very helpful these days. Endoscopic ultrasound has become more and more of a useful tool for us uh, and certainly very helpful uh, for this. Although if you're seriously considering a, a totally endoluminal resection, uh, needle biopsies uh, probably should not be done uh, unless absolutely needed. And I'm sure the other speakers will, will address that. And it's also uh, to consider that there's some locations that are simply difficult, no matter how you do it, endoscopic, open, or laparoscopic or hybrid. And, and those typically would be large lesions in the proximal stomach uh, adjacent or including uh, the lower esophageal sphincter. And, and I'll briefly talk about uh, handling those uh, cases as well. So, so what are these hybrid techniques, uh, the laparoendoscopic techniques? Uh, there's kind of a, a, a nearly laparoscopic approach that we call laparoscopic transgastric approach. Then of course there's use of flexible endoscopy for localization uh, with a laparoscopic resection, either intragastric or extragastric, and then totally intragastric resection, either with or without flexible endoscopy uh, imaging. So this is just uh, an illustration of kind of what that looks like uh, using the flexible endoscope to map out the lesion, define its margin, and direct uh, laparoscopic intervention uh, either from the outside of the stomach or increasingly from the inside of the stomach, and sometimes using uh, specialized tools uh, as well. This, this is our current um, algorithm for treatment. Um, we, we really like doing endoscopic resections uh, whenever we can. Uh, and you'll see reports in the literature of quite large lesions uh, being removed uh, uh, up to 10 centimeters. But for us, um, we prefer if they're more than five centimeters, we would tend to do a more surgical or hybrid approach, less than five centimeters, easy access. Uh, we'll do a totally endoscopic approach. Also, you have to take into consideration the, the malignancy risk. Uh, you know, if there's a good chance that there's malignancy involved, you want more extensive margins. And obviously that's probably easier to achieve with a laparoscopic approach than it is with an endoscopic uh, approach where you have risk of disrupting the capsule of the tumor and disseminating uh, a cancer. Um, also, um, whether they're exophytic or endophytic kind of directs your laparoscopic approach uh, because uh, obviously it's, if it's a exophytic lesion, it's a little bit easier to approach from the outside of the stomach, uh, endophytic uh, from the inside of the stomach. So just uh, once again, to, to recap that because this decision is quite critical when you're doing your preoperative planning, a small size lesion, uh, where it's located, uh, and then the classic indicators of a risk for malignancy, um, uh, less than two centimeters, uh, mitotic factors, less, mitotic uh, figures less than 50 for high powered field, uh, et cetera. Uh, any of these are greater than one should consider neoadjuvant uh, treatment to lower that risk. So this is an illustration of a transgastric approach. You can see a large uh, ulcerated endophytic uh, uh, gist. Being mapped out by endoscopy. And actually in this case, uh, it doesn't, it's not shown in this video clip, 
but injecting uh, some methylene blue around the base of the lesion to further uh, define the, the uh, resection margins. You can see endoscopic trans, transvisualization to help place a, a laparoscopic approach. And in this case, uh, with quite a large tumor, uh, with some risk of malignancy because of its size, because of the ulceration, uh, we elected to do a transgastric approach. So we're making a longitudinal incision in the stomach. Exposing the tumor. Putting a retraction suture. In the tumor and then using a, a articulating a laparoscopic stapler uh, to do a full thickness resection. Uh, put it in a specimen, impermeable specimen bag to pretend, protect against tumor dissemination, and then do uh, a suture closure of it. You can see we're overstowing the staple line to minimize bleeding, and then a simple running uh, laparoscopic uh, suture to close, close the lesion. So that certainly is, a, and you can see that we left the specimen bag in the abdomen and at the end would widen one of the trocar sites to remove the specimen. So another option is uh, endoscopic guided laparoscopic uh, resection, which is an intragastric uh, type of resection. And this will illustrate that. Here you can see a rather exophytic lesion the scope in place to kind of define the mucosal margins. Laparoscopic mobilization. This also allows a chance to look for any suspicious uh, lymph nodes, and if, if there are any, to take those as well, just for uh, thorough staging. A bit so cleaning off both sides of the stomach. And all the time there's a flexible endoscope in the lumen, kind of uh, helping map out and transilluminating uh, to determine the margins. Here you can see the endoscope kind of pointing out where our resection margins are going to be. Once again, putting a retraction suture in. And then once again, uh, using a laparoscopic stapler to do a wedge resection of this lesion. You can see the scope, once again, looking to make sure that the tumor is completely inside the stable resection line. Let's be a classic uh, wedge. intersection. So uh, then the last uh, approach that I'll uh, talk about is an intergastric uh, laparoscopic resection, either with or without flexible endoscopic visualization. Usually you need both. You need a flexible endoscope uh, to kind of, once again, because of its mobility. However, doing laparoscopic surgery under flexible endoscopic uh, visualization is a little bit uh, difficult because of the orientation and horizon issues. Uh, but uh, th this really offers a nice approach, uh, precise visualization of the resection margins. Uh, you can use endoscopic instruments like snares, uh, specimen bags, and this allows nose or natural orifice specimen extraction uh, 
if the tumor isn't uh, too big, you can put it in a specimen bag and remove it uh, through the esophagus and out the mouth uh, as long as it's uh, uh, not overly large. Uh, morcelization uh, is possible, but uh, a little bit controversy uh, when we're talking about GIST. So there's two methods to gain access. One's a direct method, so uh, much as we would do a PEG approach, and this is a modified PEG type of uh, trocar um, that's available. And we simply do transluminal uh, visualization, uh, put uh, a needle in, and then put uh, a series of three or four trocars uh, in the gastric lumen. Uh, alternatively, you can do put a, a laparoscope in especially if you need to look around the abdomen and do a little bit of examination. Uh, sorry about the sound there. I'm just going to step out and turn the sound off. Especially since it's in French, so it wouldn't be that interesting to most people. Let's try that again. So once again, uh, flexible endoscopy is very critical on this because if you put the uh, ports in the wrong part of the stomach, it can be very difficult to access. It's very convenient to tack the stomach up to the anterior abdominal wall. Uh, this is to prove the trocars from the ports from falling out of the stomach. And make a small incision. It's for trocar. These, these days we use mini laparoscopy instruments, so three millimeter uh, and a five millimeter scope. Uh, back in the day, we used uh, a larger, uh, larger endoscope. additional trocars, and as I say, typically three are needed, sometimes a fourth as well, depends on whether you use the flexible endoscope as an ancillary uh, instrument or not. And this shows uh, being able to grasp and retract uh, using standard laparoscopic instruments. and do a full thickness resection. So you can see the retroperitoneal vat uh, vis vis visible. And of course you could do this endoscopically. Uh, we'll, we'll hear more about that later, but uh, this is quite fast, um, quite rapid. Uh, and gives you quite a bit of control, as well as the ability to do a, a very thorough closure um, and, and closure after endoscopic full thickness resection is still an evolving uh, technique. And this just shows closing the defect. This is also a very useful technique uh, when the lesions are adjacent to the lower esophageal sphincter. Uh, you can kind of do a very tailored resection and then you have the ability to uh, both inside of the stomach and outside of the stomach recreate the lower esophageal uh, sphincter. Uh, sometimes even add a anti-reflux mechanism if you think you've compromised the uh, reflux valve. And in the end, we put the specimen in a specimen retrieval bag or use a Roth net and remove it out of the esophagus. Um, and the patient really has a, a very minimally invasive uh, closure. The port sites can either be closed, um, either be closed with um, Ovesco clips, standard clips, or you can pull the ports out and close it laparoscopically with uh, a small figure of eight suture. Uh, as I mentioned, one of the advantages to this is you can use ancillary uh, endoscopic instruments, uh, a snare to clean things up, an argon beam, 
uh, coagulator to, to get better hemostasis and specimen bags uh, or roth nets uh, to remove the specimen. So very, very useful, very good. Uh, very Endoscopic in a canine model. Demon and um, sorry about the voice again on that. But uh, this would be a fantastic procedure as well if we had the ability to um, if we had the ability to uh, have endoscopic staplers, and there have been some prototypes around. Uh, many many hyperscopic surgeons are familiar with this one. Uh, there's some flexible endoscopic uh, uh, prototypes, but nothing commercially available. But once things like this are available, uh, totally endoluminal resections uh, are certainly going to be more easy uh, to perform. I mentioned that another very useful thing, and these days we mostly use our, our uh, needlescopic, uh, laparoscopic tools, either two millimeter, three millimeter, and a five millimeter camera. This makes it quite easy. And when we use these, we'll typically close the gastric defect in, endoscopically uh, using standard clips. If you read the literature, you'll also notice some people using uh, single incision laparoscopy ports uh, in the stomach. This can be useful if you have a larger lesion uh, that you want to remove because uh, it leaves a, a fairly big uh, defect in the stomach wall that has to be uh, closed surgically. Uh, but that's yet another tool that we have our, at our disposal. So these, these are just uh, our results um, uh, over the years. It's not a real common indication, but as you can see, the time is quite reasonable. Uh, tumors are vary a bit inside, uh, but the patients go home quite easy, um, quite early, and uh, complications are extremely rare. So in conclusions, uh, uh, lateral endoluminal resection is a perfect example of hybrid surgery that we talk about a lot. Uh, laparoscopy brings the benefits of, of uh, robust instruments that make it quite fast, uh, the ability to achieve wide margins in the case of uh, malignancy risk, uh, the ability to add adjunct procedures like uh, lymph node sampling or an anti-reflux valve if you're forced to resect the lower esophageal sphincter. And of course, flexible endoscopy uh, brings the benefit of a magnified view. Uh, it's a very low impact and minimally invasive nature. A precise definition of the intergastric margins. You can even use CLE and, and chromoendoscopy. And once again, the ability of a natural orifice specimen extraction uh, can really make this uh, impact on the patient very negligible. So once again, I'd like to thank you for allowing me the opportunity to present. Thank you very much, uh, Lee. Um, we'll save um, the uh, question and uh, answer uh, session to the last of the session. So please stay uh, with us. So uh, our next uh, speaker is uh, Professor uh, Ito. Uh, he is actually the chief of uh, GI surgery and the associate professor of the Department of Gastro Enterological and Pediatric Surgery in Oita University, Japan. And uh, I think uh, uh, Professor Ito is going to again tell us about um, the uh, surgical or laparoscopic endoscopic management of a um, gastric gist. So uh, please. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for a kind introduction, uh, Professor Chu, and thank you for invitation to this uh, WS Symposium. Uh, it's my great honor to present here. Today, my topic is laparoscopy and the endoscopy collaborative surgery, REX for GI GIST. I will share my slide. Can you see my slide? Yes, perfectly. Okay, thank you. Today, I'd like to show the concept of REX procedure first. And second, I will introduce other endoscopic and surgical technique for gastric gist. And finally, future perspectives of minimal invasive surgery.
this year, fourth edition of laparoscopic, uh, sorry, fourth edition of Japanese clinical practice guideline for GIST was published. This slide shows the treatment algorithm for gastrointestinal GIST. If malignancy is confirmed by a biopsy such as FMA, surgical resection is recommended up to five centimeter of tumor. In tumor size more than five centimeter, surgical resection should be performed. Surgical resection must be performed with negative tumor margin avoiding the rupture during the operation. Among surgical approach, minimally invasive surgery for GIST is, uh, has a rapidly developed. What's minimally invasive surgery for gastric GIST? What's the benefit for the patient? Regarding global evidence, there are several solid evidence of the minimal invasive surgery for gastric GIST. So far, short-term result was reported. Collecting this data, technical feasibility of minimal invasive surgery compared to open surgery has been confirmed. In addition, some report also demonstrated a favorable long-term result. On the other hand, in larger tumor size, more than five centimeter, the high risk of the tumor rupture during surgery is considered as a critical issue. Therefore, indication of laparoscopic procedure for large GIST is still controversial. So far, several meta-analysis reported the technical feasibility of lap surgery for larger gastric GIST shown in this slide. What's the concerns of lap surgery for gastric GIST? I think the first, it is difficult to determine the accurate resection line for gastric intraluminal tumors using a conventional laparoscopic with resection from outside the stomach wall. This excessively or inappropriate resection line may result in the gastric stasis or a positive resection margin. Therefore, an accurate cutting line is important for the safe local resection of the tumor in the stomach. To overcome these issues, laparoscopy and endoscopy collaborative surgery, LEX, for gastric GIST has been developed by Professor Hiki in Japan in 2008. LEX is a procedure combining laps, laparoscopic gastric resection with endoscopic submucosal resection for local resection gastric tumor with appropriate minimal surgical resection margin. This slide shows a conceptual diagram of Rex procedure. In the left side figure, endoscopic submucosal resection is made around the tumor using the devices such as the IT knife or needle knife. Personally, I prefer the IT knife. After that, resection of the tumor with a minimal margin is performed by laparoscopic procedure for the purpose of less stomach deformation. Finally, entry hole is crossed by stapler in right side figure. According to 15th Japanese Nation Survey, laparoscopic local resection has been performed year by year. On the other hand, since approval of national insurance of Rex in 2014, the number of Rex for gastrocogists is rapidly increases showing slide. Let me show Rex procedure. This video is kindly provided by uh, uh, Professor Nunobe in Cancer Institute Hospital in Japan. The tumor located just below in the cardia. And the first endoscopist uh, performed the uh, cutting around the submucosal tumor like this. And then in laparoscopically, to confirm the tumor location and cut the cellular surface along the uh, cutting line by the endoscopically.
During surgery, endoscopist uh, check the accurate line. And also surgeons uh, confirm the appropriate surgical line like this. And then they could uh, remove the tumor with the appropriate cutting line. And then they, they crossed into the hole like this. Collaboration between uh, with the surgeon and the endoscopist is very important to safely perform this procedure. After resection, endoscopist confirms the any stenosis or bleeding. And sometimes they uh, added the reinforced suture like this. Okay, final view in the Rex procedure in gastric gist. Regarding in the gist in Jodunam, now I'd like to uh, sorry, I'd like to mention the expanded indication of the Rex for gists with such as the general SMT. Endoscopic resection are widely performed for general neoplasm due to the, its minimal invasiveness. However, the ESD is associated with higher risk of the complications such as uh, a perforation, the breathing, or compared with the ESD in the for gastric region. Duodenal Rex has been introduced to overcome these issues, and the Nunobe also demonstrated the safety and the feasibility of Rex duodenal neoplasm in their, their laser respect multi center study. The Rex was performed in oncological safety and the technical safety. Regarding the gist in the colorectum, the Rex has been also applied. Laparoscopically assisted endoscopic resection have been utilized for challenge the target, which are difficult to perform by standard ESC technique. Rex Colorectum may be considered an effective endoscopic technique for a colorectum just in the future. Let me show the Rex procedure for Dunero SMT net in Oita University. So I'm performing the ESD first. The tumor locates the just in the bulbous, the posterior. Uh, greater curvature side. And I put the rind around the tumor and, and then the laparoscopic procedure was performed like this and cut the uh, we confirmed the tumor location and expose the duodenum like this. And to make the good operation field is very important. And we check the tumor location and cut the cerebral surface. Basically, the technique is the same for the gastric gist. And the cuts around the endoscopic Line like this. We could perform tumor reduction with a minimum uh, defect of the donor, like this. Okay, finish. Next, I'd like to introduce the other minimal invasive technique for gastric gist. This is a serosal and a muscular layer incision technique, SAMIT. 
incision into the cerebral and the muscular layer around the tumor. And after enter circumstance was incited, and the tumor changed the appearance from the interluminal growth type tumor to the extraluminal gastric uh, tumor type. And the wet resection was performed using a staple and the suture was intercorporally applied to the cerebral and the muscular layer. We think the advantage of a summit procedure as follows. It requires uh, the neither endoscopic subunculate dissection technique and the devices, nor additional medical resource. Summit has an advantage of the preventing tumor dissemination because it does not require artificial perforation. And no intraoperative perforation of the gastric ball occurred in the present patient. This slide shows the distribution of the tumor location. Red points indicate the localization of the tumor in the summit group. For upper regions, the frequency of combined cerebral muscular incision was significantly higher for reason within the two centimeter of EGJ. Let me show a case of a summit procedure for gastric discs located in the posterior side of cardia. You can see the interluminal type of tumor with three centimeters. Tumor located just below the uh, cardia and the posterior side of the uh, gastric wall. The first, they expose with a lesser curvature side like this. And sometimes we cut the uh, cardiac branch. During operation, the endoscopy was performed to confirm to confirm the tumor location. And you can see the tumor, the posterior wall of the stomach like this, and the moving up the stomach and ligated the some uh, small vessel around the stomach like this. And I made the cut the on the submuscular layer like this. The tumor is an interluminal type, but after this procedure, the tumor is the mimic to an extra luminal type like this. The tumor could be pulled up easily. And then we could easily staple without any perforation of the gastric wall like this. This procedure we named the summit procedure. Recently, another procedure, a conceptual diagram of the combination of the non-exposed endoscopic wall uh, invasion surgery, NUS, was introduced by Goto in Japan. This technique may be useful not only uh, arrogance cancer, because of the non-exposed mucosa. Moreover, conceptual diagram of closed laparoscopic and endoscopic relative surgery, closed legs, was introduced by Inoue in Japan. This technique is also non-exposed mucosa, however, sometimes complicated. Comparison with other technique, uh, from Japan, surgical techniques such as Rex and the news has been reported, shown in slide. All this procedure have the same advantages of minimizing the extent of the excess gastric resection, but they also have the disadvantage of the requiring artificial perforation by EST technique. Our Method summit does not require EST technology and the technique, and we believe that it can be performed with relatively simple procedure. Finally, I'd like to mention the future perspectives shortly. Recently, our focus is moving to the whether minimal invasive surgery is safe for such as a, a larger gist, uh, more than 10 centimeters, or direct invasion to adjust the organs 
located at the EGJ uh, preoperative chemotherapy or conversion surgery was a process CDA in not only technical but oncological aspect should be established for this region in the future. Lastly, I'd like to mention image navigation surgery. The purpose of this is uh, establish individual surgery. As for the evidence in this peer review, uh, prospect of course, the study showed the safety and the effectiveness of sentinel mapping for gastric cancer like this. At this moment, we have various options of the partial resection based on sentinel node map mapping, such as the REX or summit procedure, which was established in our team or in Japan. In summary of my presentation, we are actively developing a minimally invasive treatment for gastric disc and multidisciplinary treatment and functional preserving surgery, which emphasize the QOL for gastric disc or elderly patient. Furthermore, robotic surgery or AI navigation surgery may, may play an important role in this field in the future. Thank you very much for kind of attention. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Ito, for your very nice lecture and uh, also the last slide's very, very nice view. So uh, we would, <laughs> we would uh, save the question and uh, to the last. So please stay okay. with us. So yeah, <clears throat> and then I would like to introduce uh, the next speaker who is uh, Professor Hongji Yip. Uh, Hongji is actually my colleague uh, who is currently a clinical assistant professor working at the Division of GI Metabolic Surgery, uh, Federal Medicine Chinese University of Hong Kong. And uh, Hongji is going to tell us about the pure endoscopic resection for gastric disease. Hongji, please. Thank you so much, Philip, for the kind introduction. And uh, I'm sure you got, uh, everyone has uh, heard the beautiful uh, presentation by Professor Ito and Professor Swansom. So uh, I'm going towards a slightly different uh, aspects of uh, management of GIST. So that's on endoscopic resection of GIST. So I myself is actually a surgeon. Uh, but I had a quite a long training on endos endoscopy as well. So this is also my interest in terms of performing pure endoscopy resection of gastric gist. So if you look into recent guidelines, there's actually quite a dramatic change in terms of the management of uh, gastric or uh, GI gist. As already mentioned by Professor Ito, there's more and more minimally invasive surgical options being introduced. If you look into the guidelines in 2018, so the only mentioned was a laparoscopic approach was discouraged in large tumors, and it may be possible for smaller tumors, but there was none uh, mentioned about possibility of endoscopic resection. And earlier this year, there was another update of this same guidelines by ESMO, and it mentioned that for the selected presentation, uh, especially for small tumors in the upper lower GI tract, endoscopic excision can be considered at sarcoma reference centers with experience in endoscopic surgery. So similarly, um, Sorry. So similarly, uh, the uh, European Society of Gastrointestinal Endoscopy has also recently updated their guidelines in terms of management, uh, management of subepithelial lesions, including just they actually sub, uh, suggest that removal of histologically proven gists um, that are smaller than 20 centimeters can be done endoscopically. And uh, also even larger ones, less than 35 centimeters, can also be considered uh, to be resected by endoscopy. So we do seeing some paradigm shift in terms of the management approach, especially for smaller gastric gists. So we all know about the evolution of uh, endoscopic resection, starting from the National Cancer Center with the ESD technology being developed in the early 20, um, uh, 1990s and uh, late 1990s to uh, early 2000. And subsequently also the remarkable um, uh, publication uh, by Professor Inoue in terms of human poem procedure and tunneling procedure, which actually revolutionized uh, the field of endoscopic resection. So nowadays, um, for gastric gist, there are actually quite a number of potential endoscopic resection techniques that we can use in order to uh, resect these small lesions. So one of this is called endoscopic full thickness resection. So basically, we're using the same endoscopic techniques like ESD, um, but we're cutting beyond the muscle layer into the serosal layer and also beyond. 
And then finally, we need to close the subsequent mucosal defect and also the full thickness defect. The other technique, um, either called STIR or POET, uh, is the use of a tunnel procedure where the endoscopist create a submucosal tunnel slightly further away from the tumor itself while preserving the on mucosa on top of the tumor and then resect the tumor circumferentially and finally retrieving the tumor through the tunnel opening and closure of the mucosal incision so that there will not be uh, a, a full thickness defect uh, at the end of the excision. There are also other reported techniques such as uh, endoscopic and mucosal excavation, which is just a slightly modification of the full thickness resection by not puncturing through the serosa, but staying just extra seroso, uh, in intraseroso, but um, extra uh, muscular layer. And also there are potential of use of full thickness resection device, which I will not elaborate too much here because this device uh, has a limitation of lesion size, uh, which may not be that appropriate uh, in the use for gastric gist. So back in 2019, the ASG Technologic uh, Committee actually tried to unify the names of all these various endoscopic resections. So nowadays, um, the full thickness resection usually would be called exposed type of EFTR. It could be either non-tunneled or tunneled technique. So the tunnel technique would be STIR or POET, while the non-tunnel technique would be the one uh, EFTR that I mentioned earlier. So when we are considering endoscopic resection for gastric gist, I believe there are a few uh, important aspects we should consider. First is we should carefully select our case, taking into account the technical feasibility as well as the difficulty, any advantage over the other methods, such as uh, what was mentioned by uh, Professor Swanstrom and Ito, uh, laparoscopic resection or LEX procedure, and we should also select our endoscopic resection method, as I stated earlier. And importantly, we should uh, find an adequate method so that we can achieve a watertight, secure defect closure, which I will elaborate later. And finally, we should also take note of our perioperative and oncological outcomes after the resection of gastric gists. So regarding case selection, I believe that uh, for all cases considering for endoscopic resection should undergo OGD, EUS, plus or minus contrast enhancement, and also with a CT scan. Um, the main important is to know uh, a few aspects regarding the tumor, including the location, size, and the uh, morphology, as well as the risks. Uh, whether or not to perform the EUS-guided FMB is controversial. Um, we, you could technically perform an FMB to confirm histology for larger lesions, but for small lesions, generally, I think the EOS guided FMB, the yield is um, not very high, so it may not be necessary to do it. So as I mentioned, um, there are a few aspects we should consider, for example, um, location. So there are lesions that are easily accessible by, uh, by the endoscopy, such as in the gastric body, the antrum, and the cardia. And there, there are also lesions that are potentially difficult to access by laparoscopic means, such as uh, near the two ends of the stomach in the cardia, prepyloric antrum, uh, certain lesser curvature angularis, uh, which wet resection might cause narrowing. The size, um, a size that is too big is difficult to be retrieved via the oral route. And also it depends on the shape of the lesion. Sometimes an oval elongated lesion, you can only, uh, you can use the shortest diameter um, to measure because this is how you can try and retrieve the, the tumor via the oral route. And additionally, the morphology is also important. So lesions that are endophytic, mostly intraluminal, is actually very favorable or easy to be performed by endoscopic means. And we also recommend uh, that the lesion to be resected endoscopically should be absent of any high-risk features because endoscopic resection generally has a very tight margin as compared to the surgical options. So if the, this lesion is a high-risk lesion, then we you might have concern of recurrence uh, when if we accidentally breach the tumor pseudocapsule. So, um, so what we can consider uh, as a potential advantage of endoscopic resection as compared to laparoscopic techniques, obviously, would be the, uh, the need for abdominal incisions by laparoscopic means. So we might be able to reduce some wound pain. And uh, certain laparoscopic techniques obviously will have to resect uh, some amount of normal gastric tissues. 
And so if we do it endoscopically, then we may result in less gastric deformity. And also we might be able to reset lesions even at the two ends in the cardiac or prepilot region. And we do not need to dissect excessive uh, lesser greater curve arcades, uh, which might cause denervation of the uh, vagal trunk and also subsequently reduction in the gastric functional outcomes. So as I mentioned, the two main uh, resection methods include EFTR or STIR. So EFTR has a high complete excision rate. It's suitable for almost all gastric location, but obvious the drawback is the need for closure of the full thickness defect and also potential spillage and contamination. While STIR are more easy and secure um, to close the mucosal entrance, tunneling may not be possible in many locations, for example, in the fundus, um, some certain uh, greater curvature areas. And it also might have difficulty to retrieve the tumor if it's a large tumors. And usually for STIR, you have a particular closed resection margins. So for those um, lesion of intermediate risk, we may not be um, able to be resected with a very good margin. So this is a short video showing how a gastric uh, EFTR is being performed. The lesion is located in the distal uh, posterior body, um, uh, which might be surrounded by uh, a lot of um, uh, serosal um, vessels if, you're done, if it's done laparoscopically. Um, so you can see a bouch uh, located at the um, uh, lower um, body near the antrum. So we mark the lesion first, um, like a usual, um, endoscopic resection followed by submucosal injection. And uh, so after submucosal injection, uh, we perform mucosal incision uh, like a usual um, a ESD procedure. So important thing here is that uh, because the lesion arises not from the mucosa, so unlike ESD, you do not need to resect a generous amount of mucosa, but rather you would like to maintain as much mucosa as possible so that it would be able to act as uh, one of the closure flap uh, once the full thickness resection has been completed. So this case is quite interesting in that uh, we can see that most of the lesion was indeed not uh, within the submucosal lesion. So the preoperative um, staging was a little bit not as accurate as I uh, thought it would be. Um, so the lesion was exophytic. So, um, so at that point, I decided to incise the serosa and the muscular layer as well to enter into the peritoneal cavity uh, posterior um, over the anterior wall. So um, you can see in a minute that uh, would be puncturing the muscular layer. So this is the muscular incision that I was making. Uh, you can see the muscle fibers here. And uh, so I um, cut open the um, muscle, oops, sorry. So I cut open the muscle here to gain access to the peritoneal cavity. And you can see now um, we're entering uh, the, the outside and you can see some peritoneal or mental fat there. And once I opened the lesion, um, the lesion was uh, in, exposed into the view of the endoscopy. So because of time, I fast forward a bit. So now you can see the tumor outside, uh, rather pedunculated outside, I must say. So um, an attempt was made uh, with the snare now at this point, because it's important to do things intraluminally. So even though this lesion majority was outside, um, you can actually pull it into the lumen of the stomach um, to facilitate your subsequent dissection as shown here. So um, once it's pulled inside, I use a clip that is attached to a surgical suture so that um, I can pull it continuously through the mouth and uh, which will pro provide important counter traction um, in order to continue the dissection. And you can see that the subsequent dissection was rather easy because now the lesion was mostly inside the lumen of the stomach. And I just need to re um, complete the subsequent mucosal in uh, serosal in uh, seromuscular incision um, in order to completely resect the target tumor. And this is um, the final cut. And uh, you can see how the lesion is now being um, retrieved into the uh, uh, intraluminal space and uh, cut. And uh, because I didn't open a wide uh, mucosal in 
entrance or mucosal incision. Indeed, this lesion uh, was a uh, defect was subsequently just closed simply by clips. So I will not show the clip closure um, because this is just a very simple clip closure. So for um, tunneling resection, this is the example of a procedure being done, uh, a gist that is located right at the cardia, um, slight above, um, slightly um, uh, distal to the EG junction. So I decided to create uh, a mucosa incision that is uh, longitudinal, um, slightly above the tumor, about one or two, uh, two to three centimeters to create a tunnel that is about um, one or two centimeters in length. And uh, creating the submucosal dissection in a submucosal plane is not too difficult, generally, like a POEM procedure. The important part here is to identify where the tumor is located. So you can see the whitish tumor capsule exposing just beneath the muscle layer now. So the tumor is slightly also uh, located um, exophytically um, outside of the muscle layer. Um, so by incising a little bit of the muscle, you can expose uh, better the tumor capsule and try and dissect around the tumor um, with a combination of different uh, ESD knives. So now I'm using a needle type knife, uh, the dual knife, and I also change to the use of IT knife um, because occasionally the access is easier with this um, alternative uh, insulated tip procedure uh, knife. And this is almost towards the final cut uh, where I can uh, dissect all around the lesion um, to dissect all the serosal and muscular attachment of the tumor. And also importantly is to coagulate all the feeding vessels um, towards the tumor. And uh, this is towards the end of the procedure where the final um, uh, fibrinous uh, attachment is uh, seen. And we can just retrieve the tumor by using a snare uh, to grasp the tumor and pull it out um, from the uh, incision site. And this is how it looks like uh, once it's done. And uh, that was the defect. And this is the mucosal tunnel and also mucosal entrance. And this is the closure again, because it's a longitudinal incision. So it's easily closed with clips. So as mentioned, uh, if you're dealing with a full thickness defect, then uh, thinking of a secure closure method is important. Um, we, you can do simple clip closure when you have enough mucosal preservation. Um, there have been reports where the, an additional mental patch was uh, used by suctioning uh, a piece of mental tissue to reinforce the closure. And there are other methods such as the over the scope clips, and clip loop, uh, loop uh, per string techniques and uh, endoscopic suturing methods, which I'll elaborate a bit more. So this is an example of the clip loop detach, uh, detachable loop per string technique. So after the uh, full thickness resection, you can see the serosal uh, tissue and some retroperitoneal fat. So I deliver a uh, detachable uh, loop uh, alongside the scope uh, by the use of clips. So this loop is used um, to surround the mucosal defect and clips is being applied now uh, around the mucosal defect and, and also uh, slightly onto the muscle layer by the, using the clips. So you can see the circumferential um, application of clips around the, the uh, resultant mucosal defect. And uh, this is the final clip uh, around the lesion, uh, the, the defect. And with these amount of clips, uh, then you can start and tighten the detachable loop. Uh, we use uh, uh, forceps or um, uh, 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 instruments so that it will hold the clips, uh, that it will not invert into the mucosal um, defect. It will stay upward uh, in the position. And you can see I'm checking the closure and slightly asking the nurse to tighten this uh, endo loop. And finally, this is the appearance after the closure with the endo loop technique, which shows a very nice uh, a complete closure, airtight, uh, watertight closure of this defect. Alternatively, you can also use suturing methods. So um, this is a very good procedure performed uh, by Professor Chu. Uh, just recently, you can see this, uh, uh, the use of the uh, overstitch from the Apollo company, uh, suturing this large uh, gastric defect. So this, over this overstitch device allows uh, full thickness suturing of the defects. Um, so it's a very secure procedure um, to close a full thickness defect um, 
especially if the defect is of large size. So you can see the um, crossing sutures are placed on the two sides of the mucosal defect. And you can catch the, the suture back with your um, double channel scope. And you can also use uh, certain uh, retrieval devices or um, retraction devices like this uh, 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 helix so that it will uh, retrieve the tissue or retract the tissue for the, uh, for the suture to be applied. And um, uh, with this uh, de defect, it was uh, closed quite quickly um, within around uh, 20, or 30, 20, 20 or something minutes. So because of time, I would not show the whole video. But anyway, you can appreciate that um, about two or three sutures was applied and uh, the originally large uh, full thickness defect was closed completely um, as shown in this uh, final completion photos. So very secure closure and the patient uh, recovered very quickly and he, she was actually resumed on diet the next day. So in some situation, the overstitch might not be very easy to use. Um, for example, if you need to retroflex, um, the stiffness of this overstitch device might limit uh, the use of the overstitch. And this is the alternative recently uh, being uh, marketed is called the XTAC device. Uh, which uh, you're essentially using a tacker that can attach, that can be tacked onto the uh, two ends of the mucosal defects, um, as shown in the photo here and the video here, that uh, the tacker is being applied just on the two sides of the defect. And uh, you can finally tighten uh, this defect uh, similar to the uh, overstitch device by using a cinch. So this is another uh, tacker, the tech being applied on the opposite edge. And uh, so once you applied uh, the all the four uh, tackers, then you tighten this uh, suture loop by the use of this cinch device. And uh, you can see that once it's cinched, then it will tightly um, close the defect. Um, so in this case, the two there were two x tack being used to close this uh, full thickness defect. So a um, uh, short summary on some of the outcomes, uh, for example, of the POET procedure. This is a recent meta-analysis showing more than 1,000 cases showing that on blood resection rate is generally very good at 94%. Um, there were only a very minimal complication like uh, sub sub subcutaneous emphysema or pneumomediastinum or pneumoperitoneum, but real severe surgical endoscopic complications are actually quite rare. And uh, for exposed DFTR, this is another uh, very recently published uh, systematic review showing all the 750 cases that were published before. Most of them are located in the stomach and they are um, either GIST or other histological pathologies and uh, with various closure methods. And uh, importantly, you can see that uh, the complete resection rate of all these uh, uh, cohorts were 98.8%, uh, very high uh, success rate, and the conversion to surgery rate was 0.8%. The overall adverse event rate was only at 1.6%, uh, and you can see that generally, um, they are not of very major um, adverse events. So important for oncological outcomes in uh, median follow-up of around uh, seven months or up to 35 months, you can see that there are generally no recurrence, but mind you that uh, most of these lesions that were reported in this uh, systematic review are quite small in size and likely a very low risk gist. So this is a, another recent publication trying to compare endoscopic resection versus laparoscopic resection in total of 1,290 something patients. And in terms of safety outcomes, endoscopic resection has been reported to have shorter procedural time, less time to soft diet, but no difference in blood loss, hospital stay or postoperative complications. However, with endoscopic resection, there is a higher positive margin rate uh, with a relative risk of 6.32, but no difference in the recurrence of five-year disease-free survival rate. So I would like to conclude my talk by saying that endoscopic resection has emerged as a viable alternative treatment for gastric gist, but we have to select our cases carefully to ensure safe and equivalent surgical oncological outcomes, and there are ongoing developments and refinements of endoscopic techniques, which may further expand our indication of ER for gastric gists. So thank you very much for your kind attention.
Thank you, Hongqi. Uh, a really nice uh, you know, presentation about endoscopic approach. And uh, we'll save the question to the last. And uh, the uh, last uh, renowned speaker is in fact, uh, Professor G. V. Rao from uh, uh, Hyderabad, India. So uh, I think uh, again, G. V. is a really world renowned uh, expert uh, surgeon endoscopist. Uh, and uh, he is uh, working at the prestigious uh, AIG hospital in the Asian Institute of Gastroenterology, uh, Hyderabad. And uh, GV is going to tell us the other spectrum of the management of disease, which is uh, laparoscopic management of a large gastric disease. So GV, please. Thank you so much, Philip. And I also take the time to the executive of WEO for this honor. I will share my screen. Uh, if you look at the management of uh, large gastric disease, the conventional laparoscopic resections include uh, the gist, depending on the site of the tube, site of the gist in the stomach, whether it's in the fundus, body, or the antral region, or whether the size of the lesion, whether it's extending onto the lesser term or the greater term. So predominantly, the laparoscopic resections were based on the site and the lesion, whether it is extending onto the lesser term or the greater term lesion. And we had various laparoscopic uh, surgeries that were done, including a distal gastrectomy, a proximal gastrectomy, or a total gastrectomy, were initial procedures that were done for these gastric gist. Now, we seem to be detecting this gas just more frequently because of the cross-sectional imaging and the endoscopic imaging today. We seem to understand their biological behavior very well today. And we also seem to understand that segmental minimally invasive resection techniques based on sound oncological principles are adequate to get good, better functional outcomes, obviously leading to faster recovery in these patients. Now, we also seem to understand the risk stratification based on various criteria as to whether they are very low, low, intermediate, or high risk for malignancy. And also, there is increasing the role of neurotrend therapy to downstage the extent of the tumors and also to downstage the tumors to an extent that you can downstage the extent of resection. This is predominantly because of the increasing use of imaginative in current day clinical practice. And there is a lot of data to show that R0 resections can be done very safely after downsizing these tumors by using neoadjuvant therapy. And also, we seem to understand the gastric perfusion well as compared to what our understanding was before because of the use of ICG aided infrared laparoscopy. And also, we're getting more information from third space endoscopy, these being done by the endoscopies. Professor Rao, could you get a bit closer to the microphone so we can hear you a bit better? And also, we seem to understand the use of endoscopy uh, more and more to minimize the extent of resection and management of gastric disease. Now, there are two parts of this uh, story. We have the laparoscopy, we have the endoscopy. We have seen both sides of the story uh, by the previous speakers here. There are several pros and cons of both endoscopy and laparoscopy. Endoscopy being flexible, maneuverable, they are narrowband imaging. The difficulties are that it's difficult to orient, we have limited accessories and energy sources. On the laparoscopic side, we have the advantage of being rigid scopes used for dissection, resection, anastomosis, and hemostasis. And we have ICG and intradural laparoscopy. And obviously, organ preserving surgeries are slightly difficult in pure laparoscopic surgery. So we have a combination of endoscopy and laparoscopy. And that's what everybody has been talking about. And we have the emergence of a new concept called endolaparoscopic cooperative surgery or laparoscopic endoscopic cooperative surgery. This happens in a, a, a different OR when we have facility for both endoscopy and laparoscopy to be performed at the same time. The room is slightly bigger and we have two towers which take the, both endoscopy and laparoscopy to take perfection. <coughs> Conventionally, as I told you, all the gist, if the gist is predominantly located in the body around the greater of the stomach, these are the patients that are ideal for a laparoscopic sleeve reception. This is one of the simplest procedures that we do in laparoscopic surgery, aided by endoscopy sometimes just to check for the 
staple margin if there is any bleed or leak here you can see this this is how the lesion is seen and then you can staple this using the linear cutter the staple here and as you're doing this procedure you can watch this entire procedure lap up endoscopically to make sure at the end of the procedure there is no bleed or leak at the end of the procedure and you can see as you're firing you can see the staple line here that's opening up here so these are predominantly the simplest procedures that can be done if the lesions are predominantly along the greater curve and in the body of the stomach. This is uh, this is the standard of care. You can see this is a very simple, straightforward procedure. But what happens is when you're doing these procedures, the margins that we get in the sleeve resections are different. On one side, we get we are closer to the tumor, and the other side, we seem to be away from the tumor. So the conventional wedge resection is so close in one direction and involved and too far in another direction. We have various endoscopic, laparoscopic procedures that have come into clinical practice based on the amount of uh, involvement of the endoscopist or the laparoscopic surgeon and whether the region is exophytic and endophytic. We have all these procedures that are being practiced across the globe to get full thickness, to get complete oncological clearance of these tumors. This is predominantly done for regions which are close to the fundus and close to the pylori antral region, basically to save, save the OG junction here and the pyloric antral here. So these are the most crucial areas, and these are the two difficult locations that the endoscopists and laparoscopic surgeons are encountered with. And when we're doing this laparoscopic endoscopic cooperative surgery, it seems to minimize the surgical margin securing an adequate distance of the tumor in all directions as compared to the sleeve resection that I've showed you. Now here is an example of a full thickness resection that we do here. You can see this, this is how the endoscopy is, uh, is helping in localizing the lesion. And then we have this laparoscopic surgeon who does this full, this full thickness resection here. And then at the end of the procedure, this is put in an endo bag, and then this gastric defect is closed laparoscopically. Now, this is a full thickness resection, and at the end of the procedure, you can always check the hemostasis endoscopically. Now, this is another video just to show you how this resections are done. Okay, skip this video. Now, when it comes to lesions which are closer to the gastric fundus here, now here, conventionally, these initially, when we started practicing, we used to do a total gastrectomy for this patient or a proximal gastrectomy. Now, this is possible that you localize these tumors right now, and at the end of the procedure, if you have any bleeds that you encounter, we can always use some clips to secure this hemostasis. So, basically, endoscopy is used here to check after resection to make sure that there is no bleed at the end of the procedure. Now, again, here, this is a lesion that is close to the G junction here. The endoscopist is helping in identifying the site. And once it is sighted, now this is how you dissect out the entire receptor here. And then once you've done this, then you do a full thickness resection of this tumor under endoscopic vision. And you can see that, that the endoscopist is watching very carefully. So this is how the two procedures develop when the endoscopist and the laparoscopic surgeons are working together. And here the endoscopic surgeon is trying to put this, it's very simple for us to put, pick up this laparoscopically, but here you can see this, the endoscopic surgeon is picking it up and putting it in the endo back here. So this is how both the endoscopic and laparoscopic surgeons work together to make sure that these procedures can be done more easily and as more and more procedures are being done, both the endoscopic surgeons and the laparoscopic surgeons seem to develop their own confidence levels. Again, now this is another lesion that is in the, at the junction of the body and the antrum. This looks very, very simple, straightforward. We thought we could do a simple sleeve resection of this. So it looks like the lesion that can be simply, uh, simply stapled like what I showed you earlier. But surprisingly, we had this scope inside when I tried to put this staple on and I saw that we are not able to negotiate the scope into the antral region. I hope you can understand by we're compromising the lumen. It looked as if you can staple this region, but when you put this staple across, 
And before firing, we just made sure that the scope can pass into the distal summer horn to the pylorus. And we saw that if the scope was not going into the pylorus, so there's some compromise of the tube. So this is where we changed the approach to this. And then subsequently injected submucosal uh, uh, low into the space here. And we did a laparoscopic resection. We lifted the entire lesion of the thing. I can hope you can see this. So under endoscopic guidance, I injected submucosally. And here, this is these are the lessons that we learned from the endoscopy, third stage endoscopy here. And you can see this. This is how you dissect the entire mucosine is on the other side. The submucosal injection is helping us, making sure that we are not getting into the mucosa to the lumen gastric tumor. So the mucosa is not perforated at all. There is no breach here. And I do a complete dissection of this. And once this is done, you can see this. This is the mucosa is completely intact here. And then this is where I staple the mucosa here. All along the procedure, the endoscope, we have the endoscope inside, which is helping us to guide these procedures. And uh, that is how we staple the thing. That is how we staple the thing. That's the tumor. The best part of it is actually now once we switch off the laparoscopic light, we should be able to see beautifully the transelimination of the mucosa. You can see that now this is the muscular incision and that we have the mucosa here. And once we switch off the laparoscopic light, you can see that beautifully. These are basically lessons that we learned from third space endoscopy. And then you can see beautifully vascularized mucosa that is intact. And then subsequently, we close the serovascular incision here. So we have a uh, umpteen number of uh, uh, procedures that are done across the globe uh, by using various techniques of endoscopic laparoscopic cooperative surgery and with uh, very good outcomes. And it is also shown that pros and cons of various procedures of uh, uh, each and every procedure. And it also shows us the limitations, and it also tells us the role of endoscopists and laparoscopists in each of these procedures. In some of the procedures, the endoscopist plays a predominant role. In some, the laparoscopic surgeon plays a, uh, plays a predominant role. So basically, over the time of the, of the time, both the endoscopists and the laparoscopic surgeons seem to be learning their techniques, improving their techniques to make sure that these combined laparoscopic procedures become more and more popular. We have a lot of data that is coming in from across the globe to show the comparison between conventional surgery versus laparoscopic surgery. And you can see that when you're doing laparoscopic surgery, the conversion rates are very, very low. And again, if you see the mean hospital stay in these patients is very low as compared to open surgical procedures. And if you look at the complications and the recurrence rates are very low as compared to conventional open resections. And there's a lot of data that is coming up across the globe to show that Laparoscopic procedures are very reasonable for large gist, and you can maintain, uh, can do complete resection, taking the oncological principles into control. And to end, we seem to understand the biological behavior, and we also seem to be very good at risk stratification of these tumors, which is better understood over the period of time. There seems to be increasing role of neoadjuvant therapy with imatinib for downsizing the staging the tumor. And emerging techniques like intraoperative endoscopy, lap endoscopy, cooperative surgery seem to be paving way to for more functional resections. And there are a lot of lessons learned from the third space endoscopy, which is helping us good dissections on the laparoscopic side. Now, these are aiding physiologically function preserving oncological laparoscopic resections. And these obviously are improving the outcomes compared to open surgical options. Thank you so much once again for the patient. Here. Thank you very much, uh, GV. Uh, I think it is a very nice uh, presentation about uh, how endoscopy also affects on the development of laparoscopy. So I think uh, now is a very nice time that we open uh, our uh, forum to and uh, invite all the panelists here for a uh, Q&A session. 
So um, first of all, uh, I'd like to congratulate everybody because uh, this is a uh, WEO organized uh, symposium. And uh, I think uh, all of us are surgeons, but at the same time, uh, we have experience in endoscopy, and this is a really, really nice opportunity for us to see how endoscopy meets with laparoscopy. So I'd like to first ask uh, Lee uh, about uh, your presentation that uh, you have mentioned about the uh, transgastric uh, approach to resection of the gastric gist. So um, uh, do you worry that uh, by opening up the stomach, uh, there is a risk of uh, dissemination for the gist tumor? Yeah, I think that's always a concern. Um, we'd be very careful about breaching the serosa in any case of uh, a high risk tumor. So I think you're exactly right. We wouldn't open the stomach if it was a high risk tumor. So it's only for the lower risk. Uh, the techniques that um, uh, Dr. Yip outlined of uh, imbricating the serosa and things would be a good, uh, good uh, alternative. Yeah, uh, that's, a, that's a very good uh, point. And uh, meanwhile, uh, of course, I'd like to also ask uh, uh, Professor Ito. So uh, you also uh, mentioned about um, the extension of the legs. I think the legs is a really nice concept, but there are actually multiple uh, procedures and name that is uh, so complicated, you know, like news, clean net, and, yeah. uh, uh, and uh, also these uh, summits. So um, in terms of uh, the uh, kind of approach, so how do you choose between whether the laparoscopy should be the main uh, procedure for resection or the endoscopy should do the, the main procedure of resection? Uh, thank you very much, a good question. Of course, I'm a surgeon. So, so that's so my first choice, the laparoscopy resection for gastric gist. But uh, you know, the, if the tumor locates just below the cardia or pyrus ring, it's difficult to uh, remove the laparoscopically. So in, in these cases, uh, uh, endoscopic approach should be added with uh, laparoscopic approach. So uh, Professor Hickey develops the Rex procedure. Uh, so anyway, so my first is a lap surgery. Yes. And I guess uh, it's uh, quite difficult if it's a news, but the, the tumor is large so that the per orally yeah. you cannot retrieve. Yes, that would be challenging. Course. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yes. And uh, then I'd like to ask uh, Honji. Uh, actually, um, you mentioned about the uh, one spectrum of extending the endoscopic resection. Of course, we know the limitation of uh, the resection, but uh, um, uh, for the endoscopic resection, it provides a good platform, especially in managing a smaller gist uh, that uh, we can avoid a continuation of uh, uh, non-stop surveillance and we can actually resect the tumor. But uh, what would be uh, your standard approach to pre-operative workup to decide if you do uh, endoscopic resection? So as I mentioned uh, in the lecture, I think uh, generally we prefer at least an OGD with an EOS. Um, we also would like to have a CT scan if possible. So there are a few factors to decide whether which option or surgical or endoscopic option should be the better one. So for instance, the size, location, as uh, Professor Ito mentioned, in the two ends of the stomach uh, laparoscopic resection could be challenging because you cannot really do a lap, lap resection without um, uh, strict or closing or uh, without injuring the pyloric ring or the cardia. It could be very difficult. Uh, however, on the other hand, if the lesion majority is outside of the stomach, like is exophytic, is also equally difficult to perform endoscopic resection uh, because that means you have to retrieve a huge tumor outside of the stomach into the lumen for resection, which is not impossible, but it would increase the time of the procedure. It will also uh, induce a lot of contamination because your scope would have to go out uh, by doing a peritoneoscopy. So um, it may not uh, be a real benefit clinically to the patient in such a scenario, especially if the tumor is large in size and you may find it even more difficult to retrieve the tumor. We have, we have had experience that retrieving the tumor actually took more time 
than actual resection time. So, so these are painful experiences that we had with pure endoscopic techniques. Uh, so we always bear in mind these potential limitation of our endoscopic resection. Thanks, uh, Honji. So definitely we need to decide by good imaging and the combination so that uh, we can decide which approach and uh, especially in the purely endoscopic approach. So I guess sometimes uh, we also prepare the patient in the OR. If necessary, then we can uh, cover into a LAX procedure. So laparoscopic endoscopic uh, uh, collaboration. So, and then I'd like to ask uh, then for GV, um, uh, because we have uh, all this, and you mentioned very inspiring point that uh, the first phase endoscopy actually affects uh, and your approach to laparoscopy. So how do you think the, that would change the future training for a surgeon? So uh, do you recommend uh, the future surgeon should actually also perform the endoscopy? Uh, this is a very good question. Actually, the practices seem to be different in different parts of the world, Philip, actually. I don't think we can have one sort set of rule that is, can be laid down in some parts of the world, surgeons do practice endoscopy, but in other parts of the world, surgeons are not allowed to do endoscopy. So I think there's a compromise between this actually, as long as the surgeons are not competing with the endoscopists outside the OR, I think it should be okay. I think surgeons should be trained in basic endoscopy and laparoscopy. I think center, some centers, we are privileged to do the thing, but majority of the centers, surgeons are not allowed to do endoscopy. So I personally believe that as long as you can confine in places where you're not allowed to do endoscopy, as long as you can confine yourself to within the operating room doing these procedures, I don't think we are competing with the gastroenterologists. But in some cases like others, I think a surgeon should be trained in endoscopic procedures. Of course, we know that AIG is a renowned both in surgeon and also a leading endoscopist named uh, Professor Naki Reddy. And he also, you know, allowed everybody to be trained uh, for endoscopy. So it's amazing. So Lee, I think uh, you raise your hand. <laughs> you're, you're muted, Lee. I just wanted to follow up on your question, Philip. Uh, yes. And say that I think in 2022, to excise a gist, whether you did it laparoscopically or even open without doing endoscopy would be almost malpractice yes. because it, it's a good way of checking the margin. It's a good way of ensuring hemostasis, uh, that your closure is intact. Um, it just, uh, for me, it's inconceivable that you know, even if you invited your gastroenterology colleague come in and do it, that you would uh, tackle a uh, gastric gist uh, without endoscopy. Yeah, I think I uh, fully agree uh, with you um, that, uh, so I just uh, did a one recent case uh, that uh, the case was actually uh, received a uh, endoscopic resection of a gist, but uh, they actually causing all the margins being involved. So I need to do laparoscopic salvage. And through the laparoscopy, I couldn't I can guess the location of the scar, but I cannot see, you know, uh, write me what is the exact location. So I uh, invite an endoscopist to come in and help me to locate. So by combining these two, that two techniques, I can accurately locate even the scar after a residual gist, and then I can completely resect the scar. So totally agree with you, Lee. So a very important point that uh, we have to, uh, you know, um, uh, look at the combination and the endoscopy is a very key issue. So uh, I think we have a few questions uh, that were actually in the uh, Q&A uh, chat box. So um, uh, one of this is that uh, can uh, Professor G. V. Well, we showed the summary slide showing complication. <laughs> uh, do you have the slide, G. V.? Sorry, I didn't, I didn't make a question. Yeah. Okay, but uh, I think you uh, everybody can go back to the uh, to the uh, video. I think uh, it's uh, been recorded, so eventually the WEO is going to show the video. And then, the, um, so there's another interesting question: Do you consider frozen session if you are in doubt about invasion? Any idea? Comment? Do you need any situation you need a frozen session for laparoscopic or endoscopic resection of GIS? 
I, uh, I'm not, I mean, I don't think we have, actually we have, I mean, any of these patients who are with suspected malignancy, we always have a biopsy, I mean, cross-sectional, we have good cross-sectional imaging and maybe you can do an U.S. guided biopsy in this thing, actually, but uh, I'm not sure, I mean, uh, I think all of us will agree with, I don't think we have any role for cross-sectional uh, biopsy. Yes. Yeah. So for me, I think uh, only when we are in doubt of any extra gastric extra loom extra, you know, primary site tumor with an extra primary site metastasis or something that would make uh, your decision of surgery change. For example, you're dealing with a very big gist and then you, you decided that perhaps we should actually do a, a new adjuvant glyphic before we actually embark on another operation, especially when there's a peritoneal or other, you know, deposits, then maybe you want to prove it. But I think mostly we don't actually need a frozen session. So um, the other um, question, uh, which is uh, really interesting, uh, is that uh, what is the best treatment option for a large gastric just at the cardia? I think this is a challenging location for cardia. Yeah, uh, I think uh, most of us will agree that actually, though we initially we used to do either a total or a proximal gastrectomy for this, but with the advent of the third space advances in third space endoscopy that we have actually even lesions which are very close we are able to inject subcutaneously and we should be able to get a good okay i, I think uh, we lost uh, gv somehow so lee please come in yeah I, I think that's a very good indication for laparoscopic approach because uh, you can do a freehand excision and then do a reconstruction. Maybe it's a transverse reconstruction. Maybe it's a longitudinal. And then if you really are, if, if you look endoscopically and the valve is poor, you can add a partial or total fundal obligation uh, to augment the lower subgeal sphincter. I, th I think the problem with the cardia is resecting uh, the LES and causing reflux disease uh, and uh, laparoscopically, you can do, you can take care of that. It's a little bit more difficult endoscopically. Ito, any comment? Uh, you're muted, you're muted. Yes, so Raja, just, just bureaucardia is very important to manage. So, but, uh, so, we want to preserve the gastric function as possible. So yes, I, I, I may choice the summit procedure. So, so rush, even though the rush, uh, rather just, uh, just be able to carry here. Thank you. And uh, Honji? Yeah, so um, I have similar opinion. I think some form of like proendoscopic uh, combined surgery is definitely the choice. The beauty of having an endoscope is that you can always observe the EG junction at all times to make sure that you are not actually running injuring into the EG junction or um, uh, causing stenosis at the EG junction. We've had experience that uh, we do a classical lex around the cardia um, because once we did the endoscopic incision, the lesion may actually fall down into lower part of the uh, stomach. And that actually saves a bit of your serosal incision uh, onto the cardia or LES itself. So uh, that may help, help you to reduce the subsequent risk of stenosis or even uh, uh, reflux. So that is our experience uh, with cardiologists. Yeah, interestingly, uh, you know, all of us are surgeons and uh, no one actually mentioned about the proximal gastrectomy for gastric gist. So I guess uh, everybody wished to save the stomach and also the G junction. So much important for the patient's function. So even with the proximal gastrectomy, we still see um, there are problems with the swallowing and also uh, reflux issues. So um, even with the double track reconstruction, so uh, we, try, we try to save. And uh, I think one of the options, uh, if you are really having a large gastric gist nowadays, if you want to save the organ, is in fact uh, to give a new adjuvant glyphic, although there are not so much of the data, but in fact, uh, new adjuvant glyphic may able to shrunk the tumor, allow you to actually do a wedge uh, locally uh, instead of uh, resecting the organ if the, if the tumor is large. So uh, there is uh, also one question about uh, 
the role of uh, laparoscopic endoscopic collaborative surgery for ampulla or periampulary large lesion. So I think maybe uh, Ito is the one who should answer this because you mentioned about legs for duodenum. Any experience of managing those at the periampulary area? Ah, uh, yes, ampulla area is the critical region. So. Yes, in my department, if the tumor locates the just ampere region, so uh, Rex procedure does not uh, be choice because of the, uh, you know, there's such a, and it's a complication. So pancreatitis or something. So that's in that, in such cases, we may choose the PD, pancreatinectomy or something. That's a very uh, critical region. Thank you so much. Yeah, I, I guess uh, sometimes you have no choice because uh, the tumor is so embedded and the adjacent organ is a pancreas. So it's mm -hmm. really difficult to just uh, do a wedge to save around because you have no margin, especially if you are damaging the pancreas and also the bowel duct in order to achieve the wedge, then it causes a lot of uh, complication and morbidity. So I guess that's uh, you know the approach and you need a, a, a good correct uh, 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 imaging and also endoscopy US to guide this. So Lee, you have some comment. No, Philip, that's exactly what I was gonna say. That, that's the absolute indication for EUS is to help you stage whether the uh, gist is, is impacting the uh, duct or not. Um, uh, if, if it's not, I think you, you can excise it, staying right on the capsule, but uh, if, it's, if it's compromising the duct, then you need more surgical approaches. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah. I think, uh, we, uh, Honji, you have some comments. Well, I just would like to add that uh, duodenum is uh, something endoscopists always is so fear of, I must say, given with experienced endoscopists. So um, pure endoscopic resection is, is needed to be done very carefully. So uh, because whenever you have a defect, a mucosal defect, uh, even the slightest split in the muscle could end up with catastrophe because uh, the pancreatic juice and the bile juice would just melt everything away and create a delayed perforation. So in these situations, uh, planning for a lax procedure is important, um, even for any experienced endoscopist. So I, I believe many Japanese have already reported their excellent experience with duodenal lax, um, for example, for non ampullary duodenal adenomas uh, after a large resection defect, even with ESD techniques. So maybe Professor Ito would have more experience on that as well. Mm. Yeah, and uh, so uh, I think uh, we are, are almost at uh, end of the session. So the last question that uh, I would like to address is uh, Combining two questions, and also it's also my uh, last question to everyone in this panel. Um, so uh, there's one question that uh, why not teach laparoscopy to gastroenterologists who are already doing endoscopic resection? And the other is, uh, which one will be in command, surgeon or endoscopist? I think we can combine these two questions into a single question. So, uh, so in the future, what kind of training or what kind of uh, you know, uh, program you believe so would that be a really discrete entity of a surgeon and endoscopist, or you think that the border of this will going to merge when the technology is developing in the future? What do you think? I, I, I personally believe that the surgeons have to learn endoscopy and rather than gastroenterologists trying to learn laparoscopy. It's a totally different ballgame. The entire curriculum is different for surgeons and the gastroenterologists. I don't think it is very easy for a gastroenterologist all of a sudden to just because they're doing endoscopic surgery to learn laparoscopy. But on the other side, it is very easy for a surgeon to learn endoscopy. That's my perception. How about Lee? Yeah, I, I think um, and this is going to sound uh, rather radical, but I think uh, we're moving away from laparoscopy as endoluminal instruments evolve and we have endoluminal staplers and we have robots, flexible robots, uh, probably eventually everything will be endoluminal. So if surgeons want to have a job in the future, uh, they probably should uh, learn how to do um, flexible endoscopy. 
of course, Lee, you are the, actually the pioneer. I know, you know, when you are serving on the uh, president as a sages, you already been pushing the uh, education training and research in endoscopy as a surgeon. So I fully agree with you. So your 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 effort in pushing this, maybe you can see now is arising. Every technology is uh, almost uh, coming to the end of aluminum. So how about Ito from Japan? What do you think? I know you have a lot of outstanding Japanese endoscopists doing marvelous job of major endoscopic resection. Yes. Uh... Of course, uh, in Japan, so we surgeons have uh, so many chances to perform the endoscopy uh, during the uh, young surgeons. So the, I think I think the, this technique is very important, not only the surgeon, but also the endoscopist. So uh, the training system for the young Doctors are uh, very important. Thank you. Yes, and uh, how about Honji? Um, so, I I actually think there are two ways to think of this. So, a gastroenterologist generally they do a better diagnostic scopes than many surgeons because they have the patience to look for, into details. But uh, if you talk about uh, therapeutic endoscopy, generally I think a surgeon can learn faster than, an endo uh, than a gastroenterologist because we are um, very used to different tissue handling techniques, uh, retraction techniques, counter-traction techniques by our surgical training. So that uh, gives us a leeway in terms of uh, learning endoscopic, novel endoscopic techniques, uh, including resections on, or different uh, therapeutic uh, roles. So in the future, I believe there could be a surgical endoscopy uh, and surgical endoscopist, which is a completely new entity who should be um, focusing on both diagnostic um, details as well as uh, on the therapeutic role as well. So as uh, Professor Strontrom mentioned, we might not be doing any laparoscopy in, in some time in the future. So maybe this is a new job for subsequent uh, uh, graduates from medical, medical schools. Well, I'm sure, Honji, you are being the young, uh, you know, surgeon <laughs> endoscopist. You will see this future coming. <laughs> So uh, anyway, so I think uh, thank you so much uh, for all the experts uh, in this uh, webinar talking about the collaboration between laparoscopy and endoscopy for management of gastric gist. So very nice. Uh, thank you uh, very much for all your uh, great uh, presentation and discussion. Thank you. And thank you so much for WEO and also all the participants. Thank you so much. Thanks thank so you. much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.